This is a very special edition of the podcast for a few reasons. First of all, I'm in Canada in the great north. We come every summer as I've talked about many times in the podcast. And that's exciting on its own right. But it's doubly exciting because I have my brother-in-law here in front of me, the great Rabbi Shmuley Botnik. And we're doing a live podcast. We've done, of course, many podcasts in the past, but they were all on Zoom. And now we're here together. And uh, it's a very exciting, momentous day. And uh, it's going to be even better now in person. Is that right? Well, not really. I mean, if I get intimidated, it probably will be over Zoom, all the more so in person. So I'm really quaking in my boots here, uh, terrified of Rabbi Wilby's prodigious genius. And I'm just praying that I will, that I'll wing it and I'll do the best. No, continue, continue about the prodigious genius. Talk, <laughs> talk more about that. No, uh, but in all seriousness, we missed, we were doing every month a podcast and the last couple of months we missed. We had a, a technical snafu <laughs> and uh, hopefully that has been satisfactorily resolved. And uh, we'll get back to that, please God. We also have some other podcasts planned in the next couple of weeks. So looking forward to that. But today we'll do a special edition, and that's an exploration of the Torah commentary of the Ar HaChaim. So Ar is light, and Chaim is life. There's a, there's a commentary called Ar HaChaim, the light of life. And this is one of the most unique, celebrated, sprawling, and vast commentaries on the Torah. It's written by Rabbi Chaim Ibn Attar. He was born in Morocco, 1696, passed away in Jerusalem on the 15th day of Tammuz, 1743. And if you look at the Jewish calendar, the day that this podcast is going to be released is also the 15th day of Tammuz, exactly 280 years to the day after his passing. And we have an ancient custom that tells us that on the day that someone passes the yard site, it's a day when their influence is, is more present and palpable in the world. And if you want to connect to one of the great sages, one of the great righteous people, one of the great scholars of yore, to study their Torah, to study their works on the day of their passing, it's a special day and auspicious time to really connect to these great sages and to absorb some of their influence. Uh, and as a result... Rabbi Botnik had an idea to share with the podcast, uh, to curate perhaps, some beautiful pieces of the Arachayim and his commentary on the Torah, and to get a sense uh, of the flavor and the style and, and the brilliance of this incredible commentary. And it's something to study and to appreciate on, on his yard says, I'm here like almost as a spectator. I'm here just to observe. He didn't share with me. Uh, you didn't share with me what you plan on talking about. So I'm coming in blind, but I'll, I'll serve almost as like the, um, the show observer. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll here be representing the audience. If there's anything that you say that maybe, uh, we'll give some clarification or if you throw in some word in Yiddish or Hebrew, I'll try to translate that. <laughs> I'm like the scaffolding here. I think you have to, you're going to have to translate my English as well. Um, I, I want to just jump in with a few thoughts. Okay. Robbie. Let's go. And that is that there's something unique about the Arachayim as it pertains to his yard site in particular. And that is, so I lived in Israel, as did you. And I recall, um, you know, there's obviously many, many thousands of great tzaddikim who are buried uh, in Israel. The Arachayim being just one of them. And for some reason, um, there's there's just this mass pilgrimage to his grave site. On his yard site, which is going, which is really now, right in Israel, they're seven hours ahead of us. So it's going on right now. We're talking about tens of thousands of people who are flocking towards Har Hazesim, the Mount of Olives, uh, to pray by his by his tomb. So it, it really is something special. There's really something very special about the Arachaim, and that's why I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share some of his Torah. Yeah, and let, let's talk about the school as well. But just before we get started here, you told me that. There is, I, I, I was thinking, how do I translate the word skula? <laughs> yeah. It's like, I came up with propitious practice. <laughs> I don't know if that does it, uh, service. Um, but there's a, a custom, you said, to study the works of the Arachayim uh, so, for 40 for, days. So, okay, I mean, 
the 40 consecutive day thing is something we find often in the world of skulos, which again doesn't have an English translation. It means whatever you decide it means. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, I guess, um, some sort of practice that you can engage in that elicits, uh, the divine, um, merit or merit or, or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And you, you see, so there's this idea of going to the Kosel for 40 consecutive days. I've heard people have, you know, very miraculous salvations through that. So, I, I mean, I'll just tell you, Rabbi Wobi, I heard this idea about learning the Torah of the Orachayim for 40 consecutive days. I heard this idea when I was 22, which is, I am 32 today, uh, so that's 10 years ago. And I heard it in the context of um, someone offering me advice to... Uh, to find my my basher. Does basher have an English word? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's Hebrew either. Yeah. <laughs> so you were single and you wanted to get married and someone said the way to get married or yeah, way yeah. to elicit some sort of extra divine benefit is to study the works of, of the... the Archaim for 40 days. So here's what I did. So 40 consecutive days you're studying the works of the Archaim. Of the Archaim. Now let me just tell you. So this is, t- this is 10 years ago to the day because... I decided if I'm going to do it, I'm going to start on the yard site. Right? It doesn't get more auspicious than that. So I started on the yard site, which is the 15th day of Thomas. All right, so I'm going along my merry way. Every, every day you're studying a piece. Every well, day I'm studying a piece. Now, I will say, and I've heard this I've heard this in regard to other schoolos, is that there's no quick fixes in Judaism, right? It's not just like, you know, wave a, a cat or, or over your head uh, at midnight. And you'll merit some sort of divine salvation. You have to really invest yourself. And I was actually working hard on it. I wasn't just like opening up an archaim and mumbling a couple of words. I was actually, you know, learning through a significant sized piece and, and really working to understand it. And I started on the 15th day of Thomas going every day. Now I'll just point out, uh, if you count 40 days from the 15th day of Thomas, you're going to bump into Tishabov, which will has, has an obviously technical problem because you're not supposed to learn Torah on Tishabov. Right, other than Torah, that's directly associated with the themes of destruction of of the temple, and and there there are other parts of the Torah that are permitted to learn. So, before going into Tisha B'av, I, I looked around throughout the Sefer Aracham, and I found actually where he expounds on a verse in Eicha in Lamentations, which we read on Tisha B'av. And uh, I, I didn't consult with an, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, but I assumed that that piece would be permitted. So I studied um, that piece on Tisha B'av. Anyways, the point being, so 40 days, do the math, everybody will be, I'm not good at this, 40 days from the 15th day of Thomas is going to land you where? Which uh, date? 25th day of the month of Av. 25th right? day of the month of Av. Well, really 24th would be the 40th day, right? But 25th would be, you know, the day following the completion of 40 days. On the 25th day of Av, I had a date <laughs> with a wonderful young girl. <laughs> By the name of uh, Malka Florence, uh, the sister of a woman whose name was Chaya Wolby at that point. Uh, and the rest is history, as they say. And and the crazy thing is I completely was not even involved uh, in, in in really scheduling that date, uh, as you know. Um, in, in so, 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 so what you started studying, someone said, hey, you want to get married? You want to be a really nice, lovely, young Jewish lady? Maybe you should study the Torah of the Arachaim for 40 days and you do it. And the day following day 40... You have your your first date with your now wife, and that's exactly, 10 years exactly, ago. Exactly, exactly. And I had no idea, you know, 25th day of Av, knowing that this was going to be the girl. But I had this, like, sneaky suspicion. I'm like, <laughs> this is too creepy. <laughs> and I, like, I have a first date uh, on the twenty on the 25th day of Av, the 40th day. Um, do you have time for one more story? Sure, Cause before we jump times. into Before we jump into So th- this story is, in a way, even more uncanny. Um, so your listeners may not know, and there's no reason for them to know that I am actually a licensed at- a- attorney. Um, not something I'm particularly proud of, but that's just where life took me. And what happened was I was studying in Israel and I got, uh, my bachelor's degree through, uh, the yeshivas. And it's, um, it- it's not accredited, meaning it's, it's not recognized by the, I don't know what it is, the American Accrediting Association. I just made that up, but something like that as, as a legitimate bachelor's degree. It was more just like basically a diploma a certificate just acknowledging that I had studied there for a certain amount of time. And I had applied to law school through that, and and I got accepted to the University of Cincinnati. While I was there, someone pointed out to me that the Ohio bar, right, Cincinnati's in Ohio, 
is very particular about the uh, your credentials in terms of taking the bar. And I um, I got really nervous about that, and I called them up and I said, "Look, I, I have this." Uh, bachelor's degree it comes from Israel. I don't know that it's recognized in the U.S. And they looked into it and they said, yeah, you're, you're in trouble. Like you cannot, you cannot take the bar. You cannot become a licensed attorney in Ohio, um, based on the certificate that you have. Now, of course, the, the law school still took your money, right? Oh, the, no, the law yeah. school is like, oh, we're taking your money, even though you, it's not useful. So, yeah, so you have a useless, I have a useless undergrad exactly. degree. And you you already now deep into law school. Yeah. So I said to to the fellow uh, at the bar at, who I was talking to, like, so what am I supposed to do? I just like moved literally across the globe <laughs> to go to law school and become a lawyer. And you're essentially telling me that that was all a mistake. It was all erroneous. It's not happening. I'm up against the brick wall. And they said, yeah, kind of. What you can do is you can submit a petition to the to the Supreme Court of Ohio. Which that sounds like a lovely thing to do, right? When in your spare time, what else would you want to do other than submit a petition to the Supreme Court of Ohio? Anyways, I did that and I was going crazy. I was like calling them every single day. I'm like, did you hear from the Supreme Court yet? Did you hear from the Supreme Court yet? No, nothing pending. Your petition is pending. Anyways, comes along um, the yard side of the Archaim, right? The 15th day of Thomas. And like, I am doing 40 days. <laughs> I don't remember if it was, I I feel like there was other things going on that I decided I'm doing 40 days for. I I don't remember, but that was definitely one of the things I had in mind. And I started doing 40 days. And I'll admit, I completely lost track of the 40 days. I was just learning Orachayim at that point. I wasn't even looking at, I wasn't counting days. I wasn't looking at the date. And one day I just call up the, uh, the bar as I did frequently. And I said, hi, my name is Samuel Botnick. And the woman on the line, she gasps. She's like, Samuel Vonnegut? I'm like, yeah. She's like, I'm in the middle of drafting an email to you. Your petition to the Supreme Court was granted. You can take the bar. I'm like, I'm like, that's great. And then I think it was my wife that said, do you know what day it is today? I'm like, no. Like, it's the 25th day of Av. <laughs> you just finished 40 days. And I had no idea. Uh, so that's incredible. So yes, I did take the bar in Ohio and I passed. And, so there's uh, this custom that we study the words of Arachayim for 40 days and we get salvation. We did. It's just the, the the Torah of this great giant, this righteous uh, sage who is universally called Arachaim Hakadosh, right? The, the holy Arachaim. He said his Torah just has such power. All Torah has power, but this one specifically, forty days. It's been shown. It's been demonstrated. It's been documented to provide salvation. And uh, you are a living example of that. Yeah, and, and I can't explain why. Like, I do not know why that is. I, I've heard it said about other great sages as well. I don't know, the Archim is not the only one. But there's this idea, for some reason, certain tzaddikim have, you know, singular effect to, singular capability to affect salvation, you know, from, from on high. So that's what we're going to do. I hope this, uh, th- this elicits, uh, you know, divine favor for, for myself, for Rabbi Wolby, and for all of our listeners. Let's go. So, so now we're going to get a little sampling of of the kind of of Torah you can expect from the from the works of the Arachaim. And if there is if there's a groundswell of people who say, send me an email, Rabbi Wolby, I I, I want to study forty days of Arachaim. I'm in. I'm convinced. Give me the stool of the propitious practice. <laughs> <laughs> How do I do it? So, if there's a groundswell, would you agree to maybe? you know, accommodate. <laughs> I will absolutely not do it on the seventh day of each week. Okay, not on Shabbos. <laughs> not on Shabbos. Not on Yom Tif. But if, um, if there's an interest in people who want to so, study Arachayim and you're willing to help them in some capacity, they should... I, I'm definitely definitely open to the conversation. Um, it, I've done it before. I've done it before in, in the past. I, I've I'm part Torah. of a WhatsApp group, a now defunct WhatsApp group, <laughs> where uh, it was. It's titled Arachaim Yomi. Every day Arachaim, and it was hosted by Rabbi Botnik. And every day you would unveil something brilliant, genius. Like it was like two, three, four, five minutes. But you did it for forty days. Is that right? That, that was the idea. Then it went on indefinitely. But yeah, and at some point I just petered out. Um, I, I will say this: that like you, you, you asked me if this is a sampling of the kind of Torah you can expect. Sort of, not exactly, because the Archaim is, is uniquely diverse in his style. You'll find pieces from the Archaim which are extremely technical, very halachic. Um, you'll find other pieces that are very Kabbalistic, you know, way above my head. Um, you'll find, you'll find very textual 
pieces, which are just like going to like nitty gritty grammar uh, kind of discussions. And then you'll find, which I would say maybe is you know, 30 or 40% of this, of his work, which is what I'm going to share today, which is, you know, very beautiful ideas that can be gleaned from the verses and yes. things that can be, and can be applied in a practical way. Yeah, and, and, and they're beautiful ideas, but they're very much rooted in the text, right? At least starts off Always, with the actual yeah. text and says, okay, he notices the text, he examines it, and he asks some incisive questions, and he uses that to build a beautiful idea, which is an idea that's broadly applicable, not just to that verse, but to, you know, to our lives and to uh, elsewhere in the Torah as well. Exactly. Yeah. It, it is almost always very Listen, much. Listen, this is one of the greatest commentaries, you know, even though he's relatively modern, he's only 280 years old, but it's, it's just, you'll find it in every uh, copy of a, of a, of a, what I call a teacher's edition of the Chomish. Yeah. Uh, it's everywhere. So th- th- this is the one that does not need our approval, but let's get a sense of uh, some of the, of some of the ideas that we can find, um, curated from his commentary on, on the Torah. Okay. So let's, let's jump into it. Um, so I, again, I just chose at random kind of a few pieces and, and I hope you, you like them. I, I certainly do. We're going to start with uh, a few pieces on Shabbos. Okay. Shabbos is a very universal concept, very relatable. So it says, the, the verse says, this is in Shemos, uh, Perek Chaf, Pasek Yud. So chapter 20, verse 10. Exodus. Exodus. Yeah. Exodus 20, 10. That sounds like it's in the Ten Commandments. Yeah, right? yeah, I think that is where it is. And over there it's discussing uh, Shabbos because Shabbos is one of the Ten Commandments. And in, in explaining, describing why one should observe Shabbos, the, the, the verse says, right? It's six days God created the, the heaven and the earth and on the seventh day he rested. All right, that, that sounds simple enough. Now, but again, like you mentioned, he's very textual, right? And if you look at the at the text, the exact wording, there is something a little obscure because if you were to translate the words literally, it says, God created, God created six days. Now, how do you explain it? God created six days? It means the, the verse is saying that God created the world, the heavens, the earth, the land, everything that's in it, the seas, in six days. But the way the verse is structured doesn't say bishaches yamim, right? That's what it would say in six days, right? Is that the question? Yeah, it sounds like God. Cre- it sounds like this. It sounds like God created six days. Period. Bishaches yamim asa Hashem for six days God made. That's how it translates, right? Not in six days. Is right, that the question? Right. Yes, yes. Okay. I, I, I think that is the question. I mean, you'll, you'll you'll figure out the question based on the answer. Okay. His answer is like this: that. God created the, the when God created the world. He created a world that could only exist for six days. Okay, this was a six day. Um, this this was a six day creation. Could not survive beyond six days. He says what happened was then Shabbos came along, and the spiritual energy of Shabbos reinvigorated creation allowing for another six days to exist mm. so it's, it's an amazing idea meaning what god created was only six days and then he brought this idea of shabbos into the world which allows another six days so and, and that and that pattern follows throughout all of time so like every i feel like i i don't know do you have this or will be like at the, as shabbos enters you're just like completely exhausted it happens every single week. No matter how much I may have slept on Thursday night, comes Friday night and I'm exhausted. And it's, it's maybe just like reflecting this reality where it's like the world. God created a six day universe. Exactly. That's it. That's it. That's it. Wow. That's and that's, unbelievable. You're right. Yeah. And the world is, is like exhausted once it hits the, the end of the, the six The world day. has depleted its, its vitality. It, exactly. Over, over six days. And then it becomes re-energized through Shabbos. So that's an entirely different viewpoint of what Shabbos is. It's not, simply a day of rest, relaxation to go back to the grind and the rat race of, of the week, it actually bestows life. It begets life, so to speak, and vitality. The Almighty implanted within Shabbos the power to infuse the world with a new genesis, with, with a new genesis that shall last six days, and so on. Exactly. You see, I, I never heard this before. You never heard this before? <laughs> this is unbelievable. Oh, wow, yes. This All is right. unbelievable. Okay, great. Well, um. All right, so should we move along? I have I have some more on Shabbos. You just like drop a bomb and you want to go on to the next oh, one. Oh, okay. No, we it. can, we can no. discuss this. No, um, this is great. This is this is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, this is. This is actually, 
I think from the more well-known pieces, I've heard it. I've heard it elsewhere, but there are actually mentions it in a few places. Mm. It, it sounds like he likes this piece. He you're, likes you're highlighting my ignorance. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a beautiful piece. So yeah. This is an entirely different viewpoint of what Shabbos is. Again, like we think that Shabbos is is well. That, that tells us also that Shabbos is not just the end cap of the previous week. It's also the it's right, the vitality exactly, for the next week. Exactly. Right? It's, it's like the impetus for the next week's functionality. It, it, that's what allows absent Shabbos, the world ceases to exist. Exactly. Effectively, you're saying exactly. Right? Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And, and and I mean, you can add to that. You know, the more you invest in Shabbos, right? The, the more uh, diligent you are in its observance, um, the, the more energy and the more vitality you are the week to follow is going to happen. It's an amazing thing because what he's telling us is I, you know, I'm just speculating and spitballing here. I, I did not know what you're talking about beforehand. <laughs> this is being told to us when we're told to observe the Shabbos. Right. So, this insight that this is a six day world and then it ends. It ends. Oh, it comes along Shabbos. And now there's this almost artificial new universe. But you're saying, and I think that's what's implied from the context there, you're saying that our observance of Shabbos is the conduit, so to speak, that brings that life and the vitality for six more days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and, and that makes sense because here we're being told, here we're being told to keep Shabbos, right? So it made sense over here for us to be told, okay, why? Why are you doing this? Because it's only a six day world. God created the world. Of Hashem, that's it. <laughs> it's a six day world. So now, now, if I could ask the question, how did the world exist, exist before? before we had Shabbos? That's a very interesting point. Anyway, it means this goes to the idea of the 26 generations before Matandar, before the sign of revelation. Right, so what were they doing? It was Kilo Olam Chasta. It was, it was, it was the, you know, the world was subsisting solely on the Almighty's kindness. But when we keep Shabbos, we're in effect benefiting the whole world with another week of life. Yep. Yeah, we we are partner we are partnering in a sense with God in creation, and, and it leads directly into the next archaim. So if you if you don't mind, I, I just want to just go to the next one because it's, it's really exactly okay. the same point. Uh, but it's it's elsewhere in the Torah. So this is in Exodus thirty one. Eh, hold on, it's in thirty one six sixteen. Thirty one sixteen, um, and there. Um, Parshas Kisiso. This is Parshas Kisiso. So I think some recite this uh, by Kiddush in the Shabbos morning. Uh, I do not. It's not my custom. Uh, but the, the verse says, "Vishamru b'nei Yisrael as a Shabbos, lasos as a Shabbos l'dorosam bris olam." And the the Jewish people observed Shabbos to to create Shabbos for generations. Now the Archem has a few problems with this. With this verse, the, the, the verse does seem to it, it, it's not so clear it's what the verse clear. is saying, it's not right? Clear. It's a little disjointed. The Shabbos, the, Shabbos uh, the Israelites will observe the Shabbos, la the Shabbos to do the Shabbos or to make the Shabbos or to create the Shabbos, lidoro sam for their generations, bris olam and eternal covenant. So, what exactly is the verse saying? It's not immediately evident what the verse is saying. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, and he has a few points. Number one, what's what's the vishamru? They observed la to to create. What does that mean? Um, he also asks, if you look earlier, the verse also, it, it says earlier, Ushmartem as Shabbos, you shall observe, uh, the Shabbos. So th- it, there does seem to be something of a redundancy here by the repetition of the Vishamru theme, and you shall observe. Okay. But jumping, uh, on, on the, uh, La'asos, to create. What does that mean? They observed Shabbos to create Shabbos. What is that supposed to mean? So he quotes a medrash, also a very beautiful medrash that says, Shabbos approached Hashem and said, he said to God, for all the other days, you gave a ben zug, you gave a partner. And to me, you did not give a partner. A partner meaning like, like a, a spouse, I think, in a sense. And Hashem said, the Jewish people will be your spouse. So, so Sunday has Monday and Tuesday has Wednesday and Thursday so has Friday. Is that, is that how it, it goes? So it, it's that's interesting. How I always, I'm used to hearing okay, it. Okay, that's right. So that's, it's, we can discuss that because there, there is, um, that is, that, 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 that is the more simple way of understanding. I did hear, uh, an alternative explanation for what the, the matchup is. But be that as it may, um, each day has a, a partner and Shabbos does not. 
And Shabbos approaches God, and God says, the Jewish people will be your partner. And the Archaim says that, he doesn't go into explaining how that is, but the idea is that, in, in other words, when you have two halves to a whole, it's only when one half meets, meets the other half that that unit is complete. So Shabbos was lacking. Shabbos was lacking something until it until the Jewish people came along and began to observe it. You understand, right? Shabbos wasn't complete. It was only half, only half of a whole until the Jewish so people if, came and filled like that void. Just like a spouse, you know, uh, uh, the each individual unit is is incomplete. They have a spouse, and now they they have completion. You know, it's a, the one soul is really a half a soul. Each soul is a half a soul, and come together make one soul. Similarly, Shabbos is incomplete. Whatever this whatever this midrash means, Shabbos is complaining to God. I I have no partner. God says, I will I will give you a partner. So what does that mean? It means that our observance of the Shabbos makes the Shabbos. We show me the Shabbos. Lots of the Shabbos. When we observe the Shabbos, we make the Shabbos. Exactly. We make the Shabbos, and I think it. Well, this fits in with what you said earlier. Exactly. I think it fits in what we said earlier. Um, how so? Because I guess, when we make the Shabbos, we beget vitality to the world. Right. Right. So we're we're making Shabbos, and we're also in a sense, you know, through through our observance of Shabbos, allowing for the world to to continue. Yes. And as we're playing a very active role in the world's existence. Yes. And I, I, I do recall the Talmud says that when we observe Shabbos, we become partners with the Almighty in Genesis. Is that right? Yes. Yes, it does <laughs> yes, say that. It does, yes, say, it does that. say that. Yes, it we does. We become partners with the Almighty, the Mice of Genesis. Yeah, exactly. So putting that together, what maybe what that means is, is that we observe the Shabbos, and therefore we, we're God's partner. Genesis is over and done with, right? Genesis is in the past. That happened, you know, thousands of years ago. Adam, we read the Torah. It happened a long time ago. You know, we did discuss the age of the universe a different time. But Genesis is definitely in the past. But if every week there's a brand new Genesis, and the Almighty creates the world anew every week, right? and he creates it in the merit of Shabbos, we could be his partner because we observe the Shabbos. Excellent. Yes. Yes, so that is what the Archaim seems to be saying, and it's very consistent. Um, a little bit more on this. Another interpretation he says of the word Vishamru. Vishamru, when I saw the Jewish people observed. So he has a very nice idea. He says, we find the word Vishamar in Parshas um, uh, Vayeshev. Rabbi, Aviv Shavar Sadavar. Oh, you yeah. knew that? You just jumped on this one? No, yeah. Well, I said it once in a Parsha podcast. You said this idea? That that means to anticipate? Anticipate, Anticipate. Yeah. Okay, wait. So Why don't we you jump, say jumping. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I, I, I heard this from my grandfather, bless him. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So this is talking about uh, Jacob and Joseph. And Joseph has these dreams where he's going to rule over his brothers. And he foolishly, naively tells it to his brothers. Uh, you know, the, the bundles bow down to me and the, the sun, the moon, the, the sun, the moon and, uh, 11 stars bow down to me. And, uh, he told his father, his father berated him, right? The father says, well, have on, have we're going to come bow down before you. And that was seemingly a way to kind of, uh, diffuse some of the tension, right? But the verse ends, Aviv Shamar es Hadavar. And his father preserved Shamar, like for Shamru, to guard, to observe. He guarded it, he preserved it. And then Rashi there says, what does it mean to guard? He guarded this thing, is that he anticipated it. He 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 said, when is it going to happen? I mean, even though he outwardly kind of disdained it and said, it's not real, it's not going to happen, but that was just a show to kind of quiet the 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 anger of the brothers, but really he he did have this feeling that maybe it's going to come, and he was anticipating that. And that's Shamar. Yeah. Sorry, I, I stole your thunder. No, it, it's not my thunder. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that your grandfather. This is what my grandfather they, used to say. What does it mean to be? Uh, I, I guess that comes from over here. This is an earlier source, but Rav used to tell us that it, to be Shomer Torah, to observe the Torah, to observe Shabbos, it means not just to follow all the laws like your program, like a, a little android, but it means to actually anticipate it. Anticipate it, right? Yeah. So every day you is that wake what he up, says? that is exactly what he says, and, and how to apply that practically, I mean, I, I think that's very that's very doable, right? I mean, it means that we don't look at Torah and mitzvahs as just a bunch of burdens. Oh, listen, I, I don't want to burden hell, and I believe it's true, and it's been proven to me, and what do I have to... Okay, fine, I'm handcuffed, I have to do it, or else I'm going to suffer in, in, in purgatory. Like, that, that is 
following the law, but that's not really what Hashem wants of us. He wants us to, to embrace it and see the beauty of it and to engage with it and connect with it and to anticipate it and to find joy in it. Exactly. And, and I mean, you find that with, in Shabbos in particular, right? We, we know from the Talmud that was it, um, Hillel, right? The great sage Hillel used to go to the store, uh, every day and he would buy a cow for Shabbos. You go Sunday, buy a cow for Shabbos. The next day you would see a nicer one. You'd buy the nicer one for Shabbos. He's always thinking about Shabbos. So, you know, you go to the supermarket and you find something they don't usually have in stock. You know, like you can either say, oh, great, we'll have this for dinner tonight. Or you could say, let me buy this now uh, and save it for Shabbos. And that's really what the Shamru B'nai Shabbos, Shabbos means. We should always be thinking about and anticipating Shabbos. So that's another interpretation. And finally, back to the word la'asos, right? La'asos, to create Shabbos, right? They observe Shabbos to create Shabbos. So we said uh, before, the Archaim said that what that meant was to to partner with Shabbos as its spouse, uh, to share in a spousal relationship. He says here a more halachic, a more technical interpretation, but I think we could maybe expound on it, understand it on a deeper level as well. There is an idea of tosva Shabbos. Uh, Rabbi, well, do you want to maybe give a brief explanation yeah, of what that it is? It means to add to Shabbos, which means that Shabbos, like any day, it's 24 hours. So when does it start? It, there's a point when it, when it starts and the point exactly 24 hours later when it ends. But Tosfa Shabbos means to add a little bit, a little margin to Shabbos on either side. So on Friday, we light the candles 18 minutes before sundown. And sundown is the, is, is really the, the earliest moment that it can be considered the following day. But we don't just say we'll wait till sundown. We start 18 minutes beforehand. And then the following day, we don't wait till sundown. We wait till it's already that the stars are out. So, so there's, it ends up being, you know, a half hour or so on either side, uh, to make it really 25 or 26 hours long. And that's the, the obligation to add on to Shabbos, not, not just to subsist, subsist with the actual day of Shabbos, but to take some of Friday and to make it Shabbos and to take some of Sunday really and to add that, to appendage that to Shabbos, uh, at the, at the end of Shabbos. Right. So it's an incredible capability of ours that we can, you know, God, Shabbos you would think is absolute. I mean, time is absolute. We can't, we can't, 24 hours is 24 hours. I can't add on to Tuesday, right? Can't say now it's Monday night, but I'm going to make it Tuesday night beginning an hour earlier, right? It doesn't work that way. But somehow with Shabbos it does, and it does with Yom Tov as well. Um, and, and the Archaim just says that that's what means. Lasso says Shabbos that you should participate in creating Shabbos because it's not absolute. You could actually create an hour's worth of time that would have been considered just a regular mundane Friday can be elevated and transformed into, um, the, the sanctity of, of Shabbos. So, Again, I, I, this is a halachic concept, right? Tosva Shabbos is a halachic idea, but it does have a philosophical underpinning in the sense that Shabbos is something of a partnership. We are active participants in the, the, in, in the spiritual significance that Shabbos represents. See, what he's saying is like this. It's not, when I start Shabbos a little bit early, 18 minutes before sundown, maybe even earlier, 40 minutes, some people start, right? People start a little bit early. It's not just like I'm saying, well, it's Friday, but I'm going to treat it as Shabbos. I'm going to say, I, you know, I'm going to, my personal observance of Shabbos is going to begin a little early. It's more than that. You're saying it's like, I am, I'm actually transforming a day that would otherwise be Friday and it's not holy and it's not sanctified. It's not, I'm saying it's every day's holy, but it's, it's not Shabbos. Absent my decision to make it Shabbos, and the Almighty gives us the power to take the mundane and to render it holy, to transform it into holy, to take Friday and say, no, it's not Friday. <laughs> you think the calendar says Friday, your clock says it's Friday, it has not yet sundown? Actually, it's already Shabbos, and doing that on the other end as well. And that is part of the the the, the terminology of the verse. So that's going to be hinted in the in the terminology of the verse. La Sosa Shabbos, to make Shabbos, literally, to actually say it's Shabbos, even though your calendar may be arguing otherwise. Exactly. That's what the Archaim is saying, and that's how he's interpreting the word la'asos in this context. And this is also a theme that we'll see with Archaim 
is that he has one verse and he can have five, ten, twenty, oh, yeah. many, 20. many different interpretations. Yeah. We always talk about the Torah has, you know, lots of different facets to the Torah, 70 facets to the Torah, all different levels of understanding and Pshat Rem is Drash Sod, different dimensions of understanding. We get that, a real picture of that, a real taste of that in the commentary of the Arachim. Okay. What else we have over here? Okay. So that's, I think that's it for Shabbos. Um, obviously that's not it for Shabbos. He's got plenty more. Um, but for our purposes, let's move on. I want to share an idea that he writes, uh, this is in Parsha Zavayichi, right? So that's the last Parsha in Genesis. And I think this idea is very important in terms of raising children, uh, in, in relating to, to students and really in, in relating to society in general. And that is, we know, um, I'm sure Rabbi Wobi has discussed this, the, the blessings that Yaakov, that Jacob gave to his 12 sons, right? So, Rabbi Wobi, have you discussed this in the Pasha podcast? Uh, many times. Uh, Jacob is on his deathbed. He gathers his sons and he initially says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the days. And then it's hidden from him. And he gives them all a blessing. It's called a blessing. The first two, first three, really, it doesn't appear to be a blessing. We've spoken about this uh, at length. But then when, once he's done, this is chapter 49 of Genesis. Once he's done, he uh, retires to his bed and he, and passes. he passes. Yes. Yeah. So, Again, this is going to be very textual, textual very nuanced. The, the verse following um, the, the description of all the blessings, it says that Yaakov, um, Yaakov gave these blessings to his children. It says, Each man, according to his blessing, he blessed them. So again, there, there's a redundancy. Um, it's kind of unclear what it's so this saying. This is, I just found it. It's 4928. That's right, yeah. Uh, okay, so the verse says, These are the tribes of Israel, 12... Uh, and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them. Every man, as per their blessing, he blessed them. So the verse says, he blessed them. As per their blessing, he blessed them. So it says, is that, is that what he focused on? Yeah, yeah. The, the That's three times it says the word, So obviously there's a lot of redundancy in this verse where it's, it says that he, he, he blessed them and he blessed them as per the blessing, he blessed them. Yeah. And then, yeah. Right. So, so this is what he says. He says a very beautiful idea. He said, I'll can I just read you the Hebrew just because it's really sure. beautiful. He says, Pirish haroi loi kifi bechinas nishmaso, or kifi myself. He says like this. Each, uh, each of Yaakov's ten children, twelve children, and, and really each human being in, in the world. His sons. He had daughters. Yeah, yeah his sons. <laughs> each of his twelve sons. But, but this really applies to every single uh, human being on, on planet Earth has their own unique uh, capabilities, their own talents, their own destiny. He said, what Yaakov did, right, when he gave these blessings, he said, he did not just give a generic blessing. He didn't look at Reuven and say, be a great guy. He didn't look at Ruvain and say, be a great soccer player. He looked at Ruvain and he saw who Ruvain really was, who is, what his essence was. And he blessed that. And he said, whatever you are inherently, that should be successful. Right? So, ish asher kivir chaso means each according to his blessing, meaning not the blessing that Yaakov had just bestowed. Meaning according to his inherent blessing, his God-given blessing that he has, what Yaakov's, what Yaakov's blessing in turn was that, that whatever gifts God gave you should be realized and should be maximized in terms of their potential. Is that, am I being clear, Rabbi Wilby? Uh, this is, uh, beautiful. The verse says he blessed them. Who's he? Jacob blessed them. As per their blessing, it's not the blessing that Jacob gave. It's the blessing that is the, is the essence, so to speak, of their soul. It's their destiny. It's their qualities. It's their inborn traits. It's their attributes. It's their God-given greatness that they have from heaven on high. He blessed them. It wasn't just a generic blessing. He had a deep understanding of the essence of each one of his children. And he tailored the blessing to help them actualize their own blessing that they already have within them. Is that, is that right? Exactly, is that what I'm saying? exactly right. I just pulled it up here on my computer. This yeah, piece. It's beautiful. I gotta just read some of the words. Does any, any of our listeners understand Hebrew? It says, Ki das, ki kol yeshla Kol achas. Oh, kol achas is missing word. Yeshla bechinas hamayla. Every single soul has his own unique attribute. 
Yesh Shamay Lasa Kahuna, Yesh Malchus, Yesh Kesar Torah, Yesh Gvur, Yesh Oshav, Yesh Atzlach. So every soul has its own dimension, its own greatness, its own its own special character. Some of them it's Kuhuna, it's priesthood. Some of them it's Malchus, it's it's uh, monarchy. Uh, Kesar Torah, which is the crown of Torah. Gvur, which is might. Oshav is wealth. And Hatzlach, which is success. So every soul comes from a different place. We, we talk about the idea of the soul of Adam being broken up into different parts, and everyone has a different part of the soul of Adam, and uh, and the times of the Ikvas and the Mashiach, of the heels, the footsteps of oh, Messiah, right. all the souls sure. are the lowest souls, you know, whereas, um, what do they say, that some souls come from the right side, and some come from the yeah, left side, you know all this stuff. Yeah, really you know this stuff. stuff. So every soul is different, and every soul has different qualities, and all that, of course, is – it's all tailored for for what you're here to do, right? You're here to do not just generic responsibilities. It might just expect you to be just generic in your in who you are, but to be special in a way that matches the kind of soul that you have. What do they say? They say that, the, you know, God doesn't want me to be Abraham because he already had an Abraham. Exactly That, that, that right. mission's done, right? right? Exactly, right. Right, but forget about Abraham. I mean, that's extreme. It's more like God doesn't want me to be my brother, doesn't want me to be my neighbor, right? He just wants me to be me, but he wants me to be the best me possible. And that's exactly what the Archimir is saying, right? That's what Yaakov's blessing was. He says to each one of his sons, you be the best you that you can possibly be. Um, I, I, before. So we, this is, so, so this really flies in the face of, of this whole idea of equality, right? There's no equality here. You know, Reuven is told, you are different than everyone else. You are unique, one of a kind. And I'm, I'm going to direct you in the proper way. And you're not supposed to be the coin. You're not supposed to be the, the, the king. You're, you're supposed to not have those things. Because that's not fitting what your soul is. So don't go on the path, even though it seems like it's enticing, it's tantalizing to, to have that, to, to, to want to have more and, and to want to have more prominence and distinction. But for you, it's not the right thing. And therefore, Jacob, with his his sense, obviously his prophetic sense, his prophetic vision into the soul of all of his sons, he was able to say, okay, no, 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 I'm going to pull you out of this path that's the wrong path for you, for you and place you somewhere else. And, and, and there is no equality amongst his sons. They are all equal in that they all need to do 100% of what their mission is, but their mission is every one of them is bespoke and different. Yes, but there's a very... A, a critical addendum, which is the next Orachayim, right, right, the next one over, because the verse ends. If you want to read it, it will be in English. Yes. He blessed them. So, so again, a, a, again, there is a discrepancy there, right? So because he switches from individual to, to plural, to the plural right? 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 Each uh, each man, according to his blessing, he blessed them, right? Just say he blessed him, him. right? Uh, okay, I didn't notice that. So, so, so the verse tells us that he he's blessing his twelve sons, Vayivarach Osam, and he blessed them. And that, that's plural. And then, ish asher kibir chaso, that's the middle part. Every man, every individual, as per his individual blessing. And then it ends back to the plural, berach osam, he blessed them. Okay. Right. So it's, it's strange. So here, here he says something so important. And he says that no, when each individual is the best person they independently can be, it benefits all of society. So, the the way for me to contribute to society is by me being the best me, and again I can I can read this to you in Hebrew because it's so beautiful. He says, "V'chein kishe yarbe milas echad v'shifo b'hadragaso lechol echav yagiu gamkein miktas dover." When a person maximizes his potential, his his unique skill set, then all of his brothers will benefit from that. So. I think there's a, a, a really deep idea here. You're, you're given some talents, some abilities that are unique to you and, and me to me and everyone to themselves. And I may say, well, I really want to have Rabbi Botnick's brain and his <laughs> handsome good looks. <laughs> That's what I want. It's not fair. Why was I stuck with my mission? You can have him, Rabbi Wolby. <laughs> <laughs> Never know. You don't give up those things. <laughs> Right, it, it, it's it feels unfair, and it would be existentially unfair if you reap all the benefits, right? So one person's real intelligent, and real genius, and real ability, and you know, real uh, charisma and everything. And uh, poor me, I was just delivered something less by the Almighty. 
So he he's kind of ameliorating the pain of that by saying that the actual benefits of every individual's accomplishments when they actually focus on what their mission is, it ripples out, it cascades out, they end up becoming someone who is is beneficial to everyone. Exactly. If you fulfill your mission, because that mission is your mission amongst the larger mission of 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 the whole nation and really all of humanity in existence, you're doing a job really for everyone. You're representing the entire universe in your mission and everyone benefits from you successfully completing your mission. That's what he's saying. So you don't just accrue all the benefits to yourself. I mean, no, right. I mean, you, you get everything, you get all your own benefits, but everyone does as well, right? You don't give up any benefits, right? You're not sacrificing anything. You get, of course not. right. All right. Um, would you want to move on? Let's go. Move Let's on. go. Okay. I just have a couple more I want to share. Again, I have to say, you know, there's so many there. There's got to be thousands of pieces of our time throughout the entire Torah. I took literally just a small handful. This one, and Rabbi Wilby, I might ask you to pull this up if you can. This is in Exodus 14, 15. So it's, it's, this is right before the splitting of the sea. Okay. I have, uh, I have some using Safari on my laptop here. So let me pull it up here. This is the reason I'm asking you is because it's, okay. it's, this is, yeah, this is 1415? Four, yeah, 1415. It's a kind of a longer one, but I want to just pull out a few. Yeah. And anyway, I continue reading the verse. Da ber al bnei so I love yeah, this it's verse. It's a fake, yeah. <laughs> so why don't you go ahead and give some uh, background? Some background. Okay. This is the Jewish people that left and it's great. And seven days later, Pharaoh is now pursuing. He's got the 600 chariots and they're cornered and they're surrounded and they're going to be Smashed, right? That's the, the that's what they're they're all terrified, and the, and they cry to Moshe, "Are there insufficient graves in Egypt?" That's always like the Jewish the Jewish humor started here. Are there not enough graves in Egypt? You have to bring <laughs> us here and die. Uh, that was a little bit earlier, right? That's in um, where is that? That's in verse eleven, right? So so this, they're surrounded and they're trapped and they have nowhere to go. Backs up against the water, and they tell Moshe, "Are there insufficient graves in Egypt? You brought us here to die." And this is what we told you. It's another, you know, why, why are you getting involved? And Moshe tries to calm them down. Don't worry. God will fight for you. You just be, be quiet. And then God tells Moshe, why are you crying to me? Tell the nation and they shall move. They shall go forward. They should advance. And Rashi there says, Moshe was praying. It's not the right time to pray or not the right time. We spoke about this in, in other podcasts that there's different types of prayer and it was inappropriate for him to do that type of prayer at this particular Junction. Okay, so uh, okay, so what does the Arachim say? So the Arachim, uh, he begins by asking really that question, which is, what does it mean, Matetzeka? Like, why are you yelling at me? I mean, so so the question is, I mean, who, who, <laughs> when you're in trouble, what do you do? What, what should, what else should you do other than cry out to God? Right, that's what we're told to do. Yeah, Moses told that it's, it's inappropriate for you to pray. What are you doing? Why are you praying? What do you mean? What I'm doing? The, what do we do when we're surrounded by enemies and we're about to be slaughtered? Exactly I mean, by enemies or or an ocean and and then the next thing god says is you know don't, stop yelling at me speak to the the people these dabra la miso and and travel so like what's the continuum you shouldn't be yelling at me you should be traveling where should i be traveling i mean I, I, right the, the sea had not yet split so there's no really understanding of how and where i should be traveling so here he answers both questions as follows which is like this he quotes a medrash which is it's uh it's a disturbing medrash and maybe this could be material for a future podcast. Um, but it says that when the Jewish people reached the, uh, the sea, the Red Sea, so they were in trouble, obviously, right? They were cornered from all sides. It was, it was a real checkmate. And there was this war going on in heaven between the, um, defending angels and the prosecutorial angels. Um, the, the prosecution was arguing that the Jewish people do not deserve to be saved. Uh, and I think the, the term it uses there is ma elu of the, uh, of Adazara, af elu of the Adazara, which is just like the Egyptians are, uh, idolaters, so too the Jewish people are idolaters. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, that they're claiming the Jewish people to be idolaters, Rabbi. What do we know that the Jewish people, um, succumb to idolatry? Oh, we in we Egypt know that or? they, 
they were behaviorally indistinguishable from their Egyptian neighbors. We know that. So I mean, they, we know that yeah, they sunk, so, yeah, they sunk the, very low in terms the idolatry, of their, yes. their, their, their spiritual performance. Was, so was so we have two groups of people, two nations: the Egyptians and the, and the Jews, and they're both idolaters. So why are we saving? You know, doing a great miracle to save the? That's what the angels in heaven are saying. Why are we doing this great miracle to save the Jews and to condemn to destroy the Egyptians? They're the same. So he says something, um, the Urchaim, which, which is, again, this is, this is heightened stuff. This is not something I can profess to fully understand. But he says that there's this idea that, you know, when, when there's a prosecution out in, in heaven, God takes that very seriously. It's not, right? It, it, it's the, there's a real setup in heaven where God has to take into consideration both sides to the argument. It's, it's, think of it as a court case, right? The judge doesn't have the license to just say, um, you know, prosecution, I like this guy. I'm just going to quit him no matter what you say, right? You have to take both sides of the argument into consideration. So what God was saying to Moshe, says Archim, was, look, they're, they're, they have a very strong argument. Their argument is that you guys messed up and you are not eligible for this kind of salvation, okay? So Matetzeka, why are you yelling at me? Right now, prayer is not going to help. You need something more. You know what you need to do? You need to prove the prosecution wrong. You need to show them that you are different, that you are different and that you are ent- entirely subservient to me and that any idolatry you may have committed is all superficial. It's just incidental. It is incidental. It's superficial. So how are you going to do that? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to do something completely radical. You're going to walk into the sea. Why? Because I told you to. That's why. And if you're going to walk into the sea on my say-so, then you just disproved the prosecution and you'll be saved. So that, that's the continuum of the verse. What are you screaming at me for? That's not what's going to help. What's going to help right now is by showing me and showing all of the, the angels that you are completely committed to, to me and to, yes, to the service I, I of God. I just pulled it up. I'm saying the words that he uses are, are very intense, right? Okay, this is, uh, he, he's explaining the, the words. Why are you crying out to me? The explanation is, Ki ain hadavar talabiyadi. It's not in my hands. Yeah, it's, There's it's, a court case here. It's, yeah, it's, well, intense. It's, it's, it's you, intense. You're intense. petitioning the, the judge, but the judge is saying, like, we're dealing with the evidence here. Like, what, what, what are you talking about the judge? We're dealing with the evidence here. The evidence is, is presented by one side, the prosecu- prosecutorial side, and they're making a very good argument. We have to address the merit of the case. The, the actual merits say that you are idolaters. Prove them wrong by going marching into the sea. Exactly. I, I, I like this idea. Of, uh, both ends are beautiful. So first of all, it explains the continuity of the verse, right? Right, That's, exactly. Um, but both ends are beautiful. This idea that we, you know, we think that um, in heaven, you know, things are, you know, th- things are much more pliable, you know. In, th- in this world, oh no. I always tell me to the joke that uh, I wrote about this in my book as well. Like, you know, when you see a red light, like, it's a red light, oh no. Yeah, you gotta make sure that you observe it. But, uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a red light that the Almighty places, it's some restriction the Almighty places, well, you know, he understands. We know, you know, if, there, if there's a red light and there's a cop right behind you, no one's going through. Right. Cause it's real. But the Almighty in, in heaven and the spiritual and the soul, all that, that is much more malleable. It's more maneuverable. We, we hit this room. We, we know. We do, we do, we can work things out. So here we're saying no. It's like, Moshe, you're praying to God. But that's not the actual point of contention. I'm on your side. There's, there's a court case here. And you have to engage with the evidence and the merits of the case. That's a beautiful thing. Number one. Number two, to display a, a, a zeal and recklessness in, com, in commission of the Almighty's will and say, I'm going to jump into the water. That's the old, that's the, that's the opposite of idolatry. Exactly. How do you like that? That's that. <laughs> Remember we were talking last night about this. What was that? About the zealotry of oh, Pinchas. Oh, right, right, right. Because that's the It's the partial. exact opposite of idolatry. That's what he's saying, right? right exactly. Right. When someone's willing to risk their sacrifice. lives, sacrifice themselves, jump into the water, and wasn't, we, we think the water was like, oh, calm water. It's like, uh, you know, we're going snorkeling. Right? The Midrash says the water was like raging. Oh, yeah. And it, it was suicide. It, it was suicide. Uh, but they, they were willing to endanger their lives. And that is the, the actual uh, disproof of their idolatry. Wow. Beautiful. I mean, just but to play practically, I'm wondering, I don't know, you'll tell me where we will be, is, is I think right, we all have things that we need to pray for. 
And maybe we have to take into consideration, obviously we're not privy to what's going on in terms of the heavenly debate of whether we should, we do deserve our salvation or we don't. But I think what we have to consider is maybe, uh, maybe the, the counter argument to, to us meriting whatever salvation we want is, is whatever flaw we might have, right? So if we know about ourselves that we're not, uh, super careful about, I don't know, maybe watching movies that we shouldn't be watching or something like that. And we're praying because we want the interest rates to go down and, and, you know, and be able to purchase a home or not lose our down payment on whatever investment we have, right? So we have to consider like, wait, maybe in, in, in heaven, they're not saying, maybe they're saying like, stop praying, do something for me, sacrifice for me, right? You know, just like take a step away from whatever, take one step, take one step towards removing whatever flaw you might have. Do you think that makes sense? And and through that, you'll merit your salvation. Do you think? I, 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 I'm I very hesitant to say that anyone should ever stop praying. <laughs> but maybe like the Talmud to... says that you need both. Talmud always says you need both, right? You want to become rich? How do you become rich? Talmud says. I always say that the Talmud waits to the, <laughs> you know, my line yeah, about this. The end of... <laughs> <laughs> like uh, the Talmud has the proven way to get rich, guaranteed. You just have to read through it. Oh, right, <laughs> there so... are three pages left in all of the Babylonian Talmud. Yeah. 2,700 pages long. Three pages before the end, it tells you the secret, you know. So if you're just reading it for ulterior motives, you'll drop out <laughs> way longer beforehand. But it does say, and it says, it says what you need to do. And then it says, well, you also have to pray. Well, mm-hmm. which one is it? It's both. It's both. So maybe, maybe this is, Matisakalai, why are you only crying out to me? Oh, interesting. Right. Why are you only crying out to me? You have to be able to take this step. Cause he doesn't say altisakalai. Interesting. He doesn't say don't pray. He said, why, why are you? Why are you praying alone? Uh huh. Don't just, don't just pray. It's not, it's prayer plus what you need to do. And what you need to do is to counter these angels that are saying you're idolaters. Show me. Continue praying. Yes. So, so what you're suggesting is that, uh, I'm trying to apply this practice. Yes. Yeah, so in our lives with the figure out like, where are those blockages? Where, where are those, what, what are the forces? What are the elements of our lives that are holding us back? Find those things and address them. Of course, while praying while all praying. along, yeah. and that's the way to you know get you know make some room, get some freedom, get get some space to be able to advance in our uh, in our pursuits and our goals. All right, okay, Is amazing. That it? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I wanted to share one final one, um, just because it's so it's so poetic. Let's do it. Let's and do it. And that is, by the way, that's another uh, trademark of the Archimedes. He does write very poetically. This one I'm going to read is so is so poetic that he even made a song out of it. Um, uh, it's about uh, following the Bikurim. Okay, now the Bikurim has nothing really to do with this, um, but your listeners do know what the Bikurim is. Or will be the first right. fruits, the first fruits which you bring um, to the base of Mikdash. Um, following so following the entire episode, the entire description of, of how that works, the verse is b'chol hatov. And you should be happy with all the good. So you have okay. your first fruits. You come, you tie the ribbon around it. You bring in this elaborate basket to Jerusalem. You give it to the Kohen. They do some ceremonies and you make this whole pronouncement, Laban, right? Talk about the history of the Jews in yeah. Egypt. And, uh, and then when you're done, the verse says, this is 2611. Just pulled it up. You should be happy with all the good. Your God gave you. Okay. Yes. So the verse is saying, uh, after you finish here, you should be happy and gladdened with all the goodness that the Almighty gives you and your family, you and the Levite and the, and the convert who is in your midst. Right. So the question is, what does it mean, Bechotah, with all the good? That's very vague. Um, so I, I mean, I guess a simple translation would mean all the good things God gave you. Um, the Archaim has a suggestion. He says that Gam Yermos b'maimer b'cholatov el He says cholatov, all the good, is referring to the Torah. And then he writes very poetically, and that's why I'm going to I'm going to read the words. He says ve'ain tov el haTorah she'im hayu b'nei adam margishin b'mesikos ve'arevos tov haTorah. If a person could sense the sweetness of the Torah, hayu mishtagim. I don't even understand these words. Hayu mishtagim. They would like go crazy, right? Yes. Umislahatim achareha. They would just be, be going completely crazy and, and chasing after it. An entire world worth of silver and gold would not be considered anything in their eyes. For the Torah 
includes, incorporates all of the goodness of the world. So the Orachim is saying, we should be happy with all the good. I think what he's saying is Bechotov means with, with the thing that is all good. Bechotov doesn't mean all the good. It means the all good, right? The, the, the one ideal that is entirely good, which is the Torah. And that is what the Archaim is telling us. And he writes so beautifully in, in his description about how, how that is and how if you would recognize how good the Torah is, uh, you would realize how you know, how really meaningless. Let's see why, you know, why, why are the sages, why are the stars so obsessed with Torah study? <laughs> this is the reason why. Yeah. Cause uh, for outsiders, it's just a bunch of legalese, it's laws, it's ancient writings, and it's, it doesn't have any joy. It doesn't have any pop to it. It doesn't have any sizzle to it. There's no excitement in it. But if you could taste it, if you could feel it, if you could sense it, if you could perceive it, then you could just realize how wonderfully beautiful it is. It, is the definition of good and you just go crazy. And we, we, we've seen examples of people that are crazy, mad, obsessed, love with Torah, in love with Torah. Yeah. And this is why, because they, 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 it, it, it is the root of all good. Beautiful. All right. I okay. Love it. So okay. that's it for so, today. So, uh, please God, uh, we're going to release this. Well, today's Monday afternoon. It's, it's Monday. So tonight you... is the yard site. Tonight is the 15th day of Thomas. We're going to release it tonight, please God. And, uh, it should be, Hopefully enjoyed by people on the art site and, and beyond. And, uh, if people want to do the stula, the propitious practice, <laughs> uh, um, reach out to Rabbi Botnik or, or myself. Maybe we'll do it. If there's a, if there's a groundswell, that's to be a groundswell. If there's a groundswell, people are really interested. We'll do something about that. Uh, if not, that's also okay. Thank you so much, Rabbi Botnik, for this incredible, incredible podcast. I love doing podcasts with you because I don't need to prepare. <laughs> you do all the work and I get to reap all the benefits. Okay. Uh, it's just beautiful. But uh, my email address is rabbiwallbgmail.com and a Botnik SM at gmail is that right botnik sm at gmail.com right. uh, at gmail and please god we're going to do another podcast uh, sometime soon we're together now in the summer in canada and uh now you have no excuses yeah <laughs> and uh, this was wonderful and thank you so much all right. thank you all the best thank you okay. everybody.